All right, welcome everybody. It, it's your favorite podcast. Uh, if you're watching this, I'm trying kind of a different setup because I notice when this gets put out to audio only on Spotify that I guess they automatically boost the sound, so I'm trying to fix any kind of little hissing sound issues. So I'm like further away from the computer and I have like a whole, I got like a huge like light over here and a blanket trying to light everything and like a telephoto lens kind of like shooting across the room if you're listening to audio obviously you're not seeing any of this and i have like kind of a makeshift like it's the same mic it's just like on a it's like on a monopod tripod head like leaning so you can get, we can get like real good hopefully close audio because that's what matters in a podcast is audio I, I mean, I, I'm not really a fan of, like, this covering my face, but uh, unless I switch it up in the sideways, whatever. I don't know. I'm still, like, this is still new. I'm still figuring it out. Also, it's super hot in here with I don't know how many lights going on trying to light this thing. But uh, it's, uh, it's today in art. Today is uh, August 21st, 2018. Of course, I am, like I've said before, Christopher Pack. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. You can follow me on Instagram. Uh, you can follow me on Facebook. Uh, this is Today in Art on Anchor. It'll be the same thing on YouTube. It's just my YouTube channel is Christopher Pack. All right, so let's get into this, and let's uh, let's follow up with some more uh, artificial intelligence things. This is uh, what algorithmic or algum, mm, what algorithmic Art can teach us about artificial intelligence, and this is from The Verge, and it was posted about eight hours ago. Uh, it's by James Vincent. Like I said, it came out uh, about 10 a.m. this morning, so that's cool. Uh, as you can see here, there's like some flat, colorful prints. Uh, it says, prints made by Tom White appear... To humans as meaningless blobs, but to AI algorithms, they look like specific objects and items. I wonder if I can, uh, let me try something here. I just made the ads bigger, didn't it? Come on, man. All right. We live in a world that's increasingly controlled by what might be called the algorithmic gaze. As we cede more decision making power to machines in domains like healthcare, transportation, and security, the world as seen by computers becomes the dominant reality. If a facial recognition system doesn't recognize the color of your skin, for example, it won't acknowledge your existence. If a self driving car can't see you walk across the road, it'll drive right through you. That's the algorithmic gaze. Uh, that's kind of like that one example. Ah, was it? Somebody was testing self driveless uh I mean self drive like self driving cars a few months back. I mean they had the guy in the seat that's supposed to be watching it, but uh essentially drove and like hit this woman like crossing the road with her bike. Although I guess it wasn't like a crossing and it was like a big fiasco. <clears throat> anyway, back to the article. This sort of slow burning structural change can be difficult to comprehend, but is so often the case with societal shifts. Artists are leaping headfirst into the... Ooh. What is this? Oh, come on. The Esma... Hmm, logical gaze. The... Epistemological. Epistemological gaze. Relating to the theory of knowledge, especially with regard to its methods, validity, and scope, and the distinction between justified belief and opinion. Cool, that's a word I haven't heard before. Head first into the... Epistemological. Fray. One of the, <laughs> one of the best of these is Tom White, a lecturer in... Computational design at the University of Wellington in New Zealand, whose art depicts the world not as humans see it, but as algorithms do. White started making this kind of artwork in late 2017 with a series of prints called The Treachery of ImageNet. 
The name combines the title of Rene Magarite's famous painting of a pipe. Or is it Rene Magarite? A uh, famous painting of a pipe. Oh, don't. So is this one. So it's like, this isn't a pipe. Uh, famous painting of a pipe that isn't a pipe. And ImageNet, a database of pictures that use, uh, that's used across the industry to train and test machine vision algorithms. It seemed like a natural parallel for me. White tells The Verge, plus I can't resist a pun. To humans, the pictures look like haphazard, haphazard arrangements of lines and blobs that lack any obvious immediate structure. But to algorithms trained to see the world on our behalf, they leap off the page as a specific object, as specific objects, electric fans, sewing machines, and lawnmowers. The prints are optical illusions, but only computers can see the hidden image. So this one's supposed to be an electric fan, where it's kind of like circles and blobs of blue and gray and like black swiping swishy lines uh, a pair of binoculars I can kind of see that kind of has a shape it's purple there's a little bit of gray some black lines so it seems to be there's like a a was it uh, cello some red blobs some pink blobs some black lines it seems to be kind of a this one's a tick that kind of looks like a weird looking tick. Uh, a lot of these seem to be like maybe one or two colors. This one's like three. Then there's like some black, swishy, like almost, uh, almost, what do you call it? Like outlines, like illustrative lines that are kind of like off. So that's interesting. <clears throat> it's kind of almost like flat, minimalist type things. A type look. White's work has attracted a lot of attention in the machine learning community, and it's getting its first major gallery show this month as part of an exhibition of AI artwork. In India, at Delhi's Nature Mort Gallery, White says he designs his prints to see the world through the eyes of a machine and make a voice for the machine to speak in. That voice is actually a series of algorithms that White has dubbed his perception engines. They take the data the machine vision algorithms are trained on, databases of thousands of pictures of objects, and distill it into abstract shapes. These shapes are then fed back into the same algorithms to see if they're recognized. If not, the image is tweaked and sent back again and again until it is. As a trial and error process, that essentially ends up reverse engineering the algorithm's understanding of the world. White compares the process to a computational Ouija board where neutral where neural networks simultaneously nudge and push a drawing toward the object. He tells the verge that this method gives him the control he wants out of the output, though it can take days to create a single image in this way, and he admits that the process is kinda tedious. Unlike some artists who work with machine learning, White doesn't pretend that his prints are the product of some anonymous AI, a disingenuous narrative sometimes pushed by artists and promoters in, in order to create a feeling of technological mysticism. Instead, he's upfront about his role. He sets a number of starting parameters for his perception engines, like the colors and thickness of lines, and winnows the output rejecting prints that he doesn't find aesthetically pleasing, although he has given his algorithm a voice to speak in. He's also making sure the results are pleasant to hear. I think I'm trying to free the algorithm so it can express itself, so people can relate to what it's saying, he says. And what is it saying? Well, as with art, different people hear different things. So... I mean, the AI seems to be helping produce, but he's like kind of, he's the one deciding what is and what isn't. Some of the imagery made by White and his peers as a bad, some, some see the imagery made by White and his peers as a bad omen, and another 
sign that artificial intelligence is not only getting smarter, but beginning to think creatively and take on roles reserved for humans. Karthik, oh man. <laughs> K-A-L-Y-A-N-A-R-A-M-A-N. Karanaraman. Uh, one half of the curation team responsible for the Nature Mort exhibition tells The Verge by email that he arranged the show to draw attention to the inevitable questions we face about the future of, of humanity. Once so much of our labor, manual, mental, emotional, artistic, is replaced by machines, what is left for us to do, he asked. How will we define ourselves? K. Let's do Kayla. Kayla Kara Nariman. Let's call it Kayla. Call that person Kayla. Uh, Kayla suggests that art made with AI demonstrates that computers may deserve credit as creative actors. The type of machine learning used by White and his peers works by shifting through large amounts of data and then replacing the patterns it finds. Kayla suggests that this is similar to the process by which humans learn art but that our mysticism surrounding the notion of crea creativity stops us from seeing the parallels. If a machine can make humanly, surprisingly stylistic new kinds of art, I think it is foolish to say, well, it's not really creative because it doesn't have the consciousness. It doesn't have consciousness, he says. Others frame the question in more ruthless economic terms. Writing for contemporary art magazine, was it Freeze, Friends? F R I E Z E. Uh, Mike Pape, Pepe, Pepe suggests the promotion of AI creativity is essentially propaganda for corporate interest. Pepe says that despite utopian, oh man, <laughs> utopian, ah, uh, no, 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 come on now. Utopian prognostication. prognostication, the act of foretelling or prophesizing future events. Uh, the development of artificial intelligence is ultimately about replacing human labor, including white-collar jobs that need creative abilities, says Papai. If machine intelligence can conquer this uniquely human realm, the march to artificial general intelligence must be nigh and the profits unimaginable. Here's a picture of, I'm assuming, yeah, white. So next was Prince, including the uh, cello in orange at the Nature Mort Gallery. So those prints are probably what, like maybe two foot by two foot each. Nice, colorful. I mean, they look like nice, colorful prints, but it's more about the idea behind it. White says his motivation is primarily to de deconstruct what we think of as machine perception. In other words, to explain the algorithmic gaze. Take the example of the cello print in White series, the treachery of image net. If you know what you're looking for, you can see shapes that represent the instrument, a cluster of straight parallel lines bracketed by curves. But there's also a confusing shape looming behind it. White says these shapes are there because the algorithms were trained using pictures of cellos with cellists holding them. Because the algorithm has no prior knowledge of the world, no understanding of what an instrument is, or any concept of music or performance, it naturally grouped the two together. After all, that's what it's been asked to do, learn what's in the picture. This sort of mistake is common in machine learning, and it demonstrates a number of important lessons. It shows how critical training data is. Given an AI system the wrong, given the AI system the wrong data to learn from, and it'll learn the wrong thing. It also demonstrates that no matter how clever these systems seem, they possess a brittle intelligence that only understands a slice of the world, and even that imperfectly. White's latest prints, 
for the Nature Mort Gallery, for example, are abstract smears of color designed to be flagged as inappropriate content by Google's algorithms. The same algorithms used to filter what humans see around the world. Going off of that, I've heard before that obviously computers can, you know, do, you know, mathematical uh, equations and solve them, you know, like in like a nanosecond. But like just uh, two people walking down the street, waving and saying hi, is like something a computer program can't understand because there's so many. Uh, there's not. It needs like set rules, set parameters, and set guidelines. And without it, it can't really, or it's hard to, for it to execute on that. So there's certain things that we think are very simple that a computer can't understand. While all, all, while on the other hand, if you have like set rules, like in chess or checkers or whatever, then it can like, it can do that, you know, amazingly well. Back to the article. Still, White says that he doesn't see his artwork as a warning. I'm just trying to present the algorithms as they are, he says. But I admit it's but I admit it's sometimes alarming that these machines we're relying on have such a different take on how objects in the world are grounded. And despite the error prone nature of algorithmic gaze, it can also do very beneficial things. Machine vision could make the world a safer place by steering cars safely on roads or save lives by speeding up medical diagnosis. But if we really want to use this technology for good, we need to understand it better. Looking at the world through an algorithm's eyes may be the first step. Even going to self-driving cars, like, a thing they need, like, they have all these cameras and sensors and stuff to, like, detect where the road is, but you need... Like you got to have very defined, like, you know, lines on the road for it to pick up. Because if you, like, I know if you drive on, like, back roads, like, either there's no lines there or they're, like, worn out and there's, like, piles. Like, it needs very specific things to, like, it can, uh, like, these cars can, like, you know, pick an image, you know, a fraction of a second and just accordingly every fraction of a second. But if it isn't there, then it doesn't have the data to be able to do it as opposed to a human kind of like, I mean, you kind of know what a road is and like where and where not to drive. So it's just the issue of we have, I guess, a greater, I don't want to say a greater general knowledge or a greater observable, observable knowledge of the world, why they need like more specific details but they can do it on like an exponential level compared to us so uh that is that episode i'm not trying to make all these like ai episodes but like i mean they're coming out and they are pretty interesting so this has been today in art august 21st 2018 this is the end of the episode uh hopefully this new setup is uh working a little bit better we'll see I don't know it's continually adjusting I still want to do the first 30 days where I'm doing an episode a day whether I continue it after that or do I want to do it like every other day or a couple times a week or something I'm not sure yet it just depends getting this like worked out and set up but if you want to follow me on Twitter it's uh, Chris pack 1986 my Instagram is Christopher Ray pack uh, my YouTube channel is Christopher Pack. You can find it on Anchor and Spotify and all other kind of like podcasts as Today in Art. So have a good one, and I'll uh, talk to you tomorrow. Later.